Adobe Kroger, Knight Errant. Written by Dan Sakura. Narrated by Addison Peacock. Dedication. This book is for all of those who labor to create but have not yet achieved. Whether it's science, philosophy, art, music, writing, entrepreneurship, or invention, don't give up. This world would be lost without you. Break the rules and win. Disclaimer. The text of this book consists of an almost entirely verbatim transcription from live dictation with all pursuant verbal nuances, faults, and ticks preserved. That is to say, whatever Miss Adobe Kroger said, I wrote. To alter the prose too greatly from its natural state, I felt, would lend an unnecessary air of artificiality to the narrative and be nothing less than an affront to the honesty and to the subject of said narrative. I say all this only in the hopes of staving off any supposition that I was merely attempting to recreate a spontaneous, earthy, and free-flowing voice for the protagonist out of whole cloth and not succeeding. Signed, The Author. Chapter One This movie is terrible. That was Rain Gillum. She said it like her brain was melting, which it probably was, and I didn't blame her one bit. The fact was, she was right. The movie was terrible. What the hell was I thinking, taking Jill's recommendation? Again. It wasn't like Rain needed to say it either. If you wanted to know how terrible this picture was, all you needed to do was turn your head one way or the other and see the light flickering off row after row of maroon-colored, super comfortable and super empty, plush stadium seats. And this was Sunday night, on the movie's opening weekend in a downtown multiplex, too. Which meant, Real Bad Buzz already murdered the flick before it even got out of the gate. But let me tell you, this movie deserved to be murdered. Oh, did it ever. A really corny line from the main character made me facepalm. I made a point of overdoing it, too, so Rain could see I was in as much pain as she was. There was no way in hell I was going to let her think I was enjoying this. I was already embarrassed enough, thanks. Jill would pay for this. By God, she would pay. You know what? I'm not being fair. Jill did in fact mention that this masterpiece was a total chick flick, but she also claimed that it was a good chick flick. That should have been enough for anyone with any taste to run for the hills, but not me. That thought really didn't make me feel any better. At least the popcorn was good, salty with just enough butter. Unfortunately, the bright, colorful popcorn bucket had a picture on it that was advertising a much better movie that I saw last week, which only reminded me again how awful this one here was. When I laid eyes on the bucket after grabbing a fistful, I almost groaned again. I'm telling you, I could have spent the last hour staring at the shadows dancing across the pastel pictures of Chaplin and Monroe on the theater's walls and been more entertained. I tilted the popcorn bucket at rain, and I felt more like I was throwing a drowning woman a life preserver than anything else. She was slumped down low in her seat, her feet propped up on the railing in front of us. In the dim light, I could see that her beat-up combat boots were mostly coming untied, and that she was twirling a finger in her chin-length purple bangs. She had her hair cut short almost everywhere except for that one part. And I have to hand it to her. She managed to pull off the look. She had the crinkled-up straw from her soda hanging from the side of her mouth like a cigarette, and it bounced up and down as she chewed on it. After a second or two, she noticed the popcorn bucket, and she looked down at it without turning her head. No thanks, she said, kind of through her teeth. The straw bounced harder. Eating would only prolong my agony. I giggled. Smart. Nah, she said. Just basic self-preservation in reverse, I think. She shifted her feet on the railing a bit. I glanced at the movement, which made me think of another thing that should have tipped us off about this flick before we even sat down. 
What might that be, you ask? Well, the row in front of the railing is always first to fill up because you can prop up your feet like Rain was doing. Usually, getting a center seat in front of the rails in this place was like winning the lottery. And no, I'm not exaggerating. The row was completely empty when we came in tonight, though. I swear, the next time I see this row empty, I'm going to run away screaming. I plunked down the popcorn bucket on the floor, and it bumped into an empty soda cup that was lying on its side. The cup rolled away under the railing and over the edge. I pictured myself doing the same off of a much higher edge if I had to stay here much longer. I turned and looked at Rain. Speaking of self-preservation, I said, Can we go? No, she replied. You said this would be good. Suffer. I blinked. Um, I said, I take it back. You're not smart. You know you're letting yourself suffer right along with me, right? Well worth it to see you properly punished, Rain said with a shit-eating grin. Please, I moaned, grabbing the sides of my head. My brain is imploding. I never had one to begin with, she said. But okay, fine. But you don't get to decide what we do next. Or ever again. Okay, fine. You got it. Anything. I've had worse. I'm not sure exactly when since I don't go out much, but I'm sure I must have at some point. Well, now that I think on it, I'm probably not the best judge of what makes a good night out since nights out aren't really my thing. I'm terrible at them. I only went out tonight mostly to stop my friends from clucking. Scratch that. It was entirely to stop my friends from clucking. Jill most of all. I'm telling you, she just would not quit. I keep telling her and everyone else that my whole purpose in life is to find new and exciting ways to be left alone, but they all keep swooping in and doing everything they can to force me to have a good time if it kills me. It almost did tonight. I mean, it started out okay, I guess. Just a girl's night out before the work week got us all tangled up yet again. And I have to admit that it took less arm twisting than normal for me this time. Mainly, that was because I had a huge presentation the next morning. And I figured this might help me quit worrying about it for a couple hours. That was the theory, anyway. Dinner went well, since I didn't really have to talk much. Even though I had to at least make a passing effort at it, since I just met Rain a week ago for the first time and we still hadn't really broken the ice. That's just kind of how I roll. But after dinner, Jill, Sammy, Carolina, and Lori all said they had to cut out early, before the evening even really had a chance to get going. As it turned out, Rain and somehow I ended up being the only ones who didn't want to pack it in. You should have heard their vague and lame excuses, too. They'd have killed you. I guess Jill figured she made up for it by recommending that horrific disgrace of a movie, and I fell for it. Hook, line, and sinker. Rain had her doubts from the look of the poster, but like a big dumb dope, I told her we could trust Jill's taste. So much for that. But who the hell knows? Maybe now that we were escaping the movie, the night just might pick up. That has been known to happen from time to time, even to me. Well, as Rain and me made our way out of the theater, I couldn't help but feel a slight pang of sympathy for those poor bastards who made that movie. I just bet they woke up every morning and thought they were making something wonderful, only to end up with this atrocity. At what point, I wondered, did they realize the movie was compost? After the money was all spent and they sat in the editing room watching the final cut, slowly overcome with crippling existential despair? What went through their skulls as they watched all those months of creative energy and hopeful anticipation get flushed and go swirling? It was like that gourmet dinner you dropped 50 bucks a plate on only to spend the night on the bowl. You know what? Screw them. Their job is to entertain me. If I mess up at work, I catch it. So why shouldn't they? Try harder next time. They're fired. Seeing as that we left partway through the movie, we suddenly found ourselves with some time to waste. I mean, spend. I guess technically we could have just called it a night, but both of us still didn't really feel like it. It was a usual Sunday night at City Place, that little pretend city just outside of downtown West Palm Beach. It wasn't too crowded, not too quiet, and it was nice and brisk as mid-December in South Florida usually is. Personally, 
I love it when it drops into the 50s. It makes the summer months of swamp ass at least somewhat bearable, knowing there's a nice winter on its way eventually, if at all. You just try telling that to some of my native-born friends, though. Yeesh, you'd swear we were in Siberia. I guess maybe I have a better perspective, since I lived all over the place being an army brat. Rain didn't seem to care much either. The girl had shorts on, for crying out loud, and she didn't seem to notice the cold one bit. Before we did anything else, we hung out for a second right outside the theater and put each other's names into our phones. That, Rain said, putting her phone away, was brutal. We really need to cancel that out. I turned and gave her a face like I was trying to say, you can say that again, but she wasn't looking at me. She looked like she was checking out the open-air jazz diner joint across the way where some four-piece band was doing their best to cover that one big band tune everyone can hum. I started bouncing along to it before I realized I was doing it. Rain glanced at me. You have good taste, she said. Can't help it, I replied. I wish I knew what that damn song was called. That's in the mood, she said almost immediately. Glenn Miller Orchestra, 1939, based on a lick from Tar Paper Stomp by Wingy Minow, 1930, although the lick also appeared in Hot and Anxious by Don Redmond, 1931, and in Hot String Beans by Joe Marsala, 1939. I just stared at her. She smiled back, and I saw that her grin was slightly crooked, more to one side than the other, and that her front teeth were slightly larger than usual. Sorry, she said after a second. I get that way when someone asks about music. It's kind of a passion of mine. You've been warned. Noted, I said. Um, so what were we talking about? Movie? Terrible? Need to cancel out? She answered. And I noticed a slight southern twang in her voice this time I must have missed before. What do you want to do? Well, Miss Rain, I said, slipping my phone into my hoodie pocket and zipping up. I'm seriously up for anything. I meant it. I am so low maintenance, it's actually stupid. How about a drink? She asked. A breeze blew her hair over her face, and she brushed it back behind her ear. Straightforward enough? I made it look like I was thinking, you know. I did the whole looking up into the side thing and even went, hmm. Of course, while I was doing that, I wasn't looking where I was going, so I bumped straight into someone. Slick, that's me. Hey, man, said some chick's voice and I got a flash of bright red out of the corner of my eye. I whipped my head around to say sorry to whoever that was, but for the life of me, I couldn't see anyone or anything remotely red anywhere near enough to be bumped into. You okay? That was rain. Yeah, I answered, but I took one more real quick look around anyway. Seriously, that was weird. I just shrugged and went on. So, a drink? Rain said, lowering her head a bit and looking up at me. Oh, Oh, yeah, I said. But I think I still sounded a little distracted. That's perfect. Wet willies? I pointed at the place. You could see the rows of colorful spiked slushies in the clear plastic bins from where we were. Nah, I think I need something more authentic after that ordeal. O'Shea's? Oh, now you're talking, I replied. And was she ever? O'Shea's was one of my favorite spots. Not to mention it was about four blocks away, which meant a walk in this cool night air which was just what I needed right then. A stiff breeze made me hide under my hoodie as we made our way to O'Shea's. Along the way, we passed a karaoke bar, where some guy was mangling a song I vaguely recognized, and before I could so much as comment, Rain spat out the title, artist, and year of the track, and even added some crazy obscure trivia about the goddamn producer or songwriter's wife, too. She did that same thing two or three more times in front of other bars or restaurants before we made it out of City Place and my brain boggled every time she did it. Even though I found all that pretty damn cool, I was glad to finally get to the quieter part of town on the way to Clematis Street. I don't know. I guess I just found the sudden drop in volume kind of relieving. There were perfectly clean, empty condominiums on one side of the street that gave me the impression that I was intruding on an immaculate closed movie set. And on the other side... There were empty lots of mangled grass and jagged concrete debris that made me feel like I was walking through a slum. All in all, it was an intriguing, if comically paradoxical, juxtaposition, sort of like myself. Ooh, that was deep. No, I'm not wanksty, I promise. Well, not overly, anyway. 
I have my moments, like everyone else, and the best I can hope to say is that they're few and far between. No, the truth is, I am actually pretty seriously messed up on a fairly basic fundamental level. Right now, you're probably saying, how messed up are you? Well, the truth is, I play the banjo. I'm joking. Well, not about that. I do actually play the banjo if you can call it playing. Not to put too fine a point on it. I suck out loud. Banjo is bad enough, but a poorly played banjo is too much to ask of anyone. So, solitude helps loads there. No, banjo is just an annoying hobby that I try to keep secret most of the time. What I'm talking about is worse, and it's the reason I usually keep to myself. It's not that I hate people or anything, and it's not like I don't want to find the right person and live happily ever after someday. The problem is that even if I do, there will always be this thing about me that will most likely end up coming between us. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Moving on. There I was, looking over the empty windows of the meticulously painted condominiums, hoping that maybe, just maybe, tonight they would betray some sign of life and prove that the whole building wasn't some plywood facade that would topple in a stiff breeze. Not surprisingly, the windows remained dark and blank. That movie, Rain grumbled, but I could tell she wasn't being too serious. What the hell were you thinking? Oh, quit, I said, smirking. I didn't write it, film it, shove a gun up your ass and force you to watch it. As you can see, I have a prodigious, elegant vocabulary. Two years of college well spent, just ask my mom. It looked like Rain liked it, though. She cracked another of her crooked smiles. I trusted you, she said, pointing at me and doing her best to look serious. And you betrayed me. You've made a powerful enemy tonight. I clasped my hands together and did my best puppy dog look. You know, I opened my eyes a bit wider, lowered my head, and looked up at her. Wilt thou please grant me another chance? Sure, she replied, and then she stopped, turned, and pointed. Here it is. Riddle me this. What do you see there? See where, I said, looking. If I wasn't wrong, she was pointing straight at one of the empty lots across the street. What, that? Yeah, she said. What, behind that empty lot? I asked. No, on it. Huh? There's nothing there. Wrong, she said, and took a seat on a low wall just off the sidewalk. She crossed one leg over the other, tilted her head to one side, and made like she was concentrating. I see a live open mic music bar. Yeah, like I saw in Savannah once. She motioned with both hands. Over there's the hand-painted marquee. It's got some cool cartoon on it. And there's the big window where someone can play to people walking past. You know, to lure them in. Right there's the front door. It's always open so you can hear the music. And the stage is all the way in back, but you can see it from the street. What? I said, blankly. I was lost for a second, but... Then I got what she was doing. It was kind of goofy, but... I had to hand it to her. She definitely could think left-handed. Maybe I saw it as a challenge or something because I played along. Oh, yeah, I said, as casual as I could make it sound, and sat down next to her. One of those would be fun around here. You play? Tone deaf, she said, and she gave her head a tiny little toss to get her bangs out of her eyes. Tone deaf, I said, and my eyebrows scrunched up together. You're like some kind of music expert, and you're telling me you're tone deaf? A thousand percent, she answered and shrugged. I tried to learn to play lots of different things, but I could never get it right. Figured if I couldn't play it, I might as well know all about it. She tilted her head. You play? Technically, yes, I guess. Really? She leaned in and smiled, her eyes a tiny bit wider. What do you play? I shook my head. You don't want to know. Then why'd I ask, genius? I looked sideways at her and braced myself for the question I knew would follow. Okay, fine. Banjo. Her eyes went almost all the way wide. Really? That's freaking... I've always wanted to learn to play that thing. Can you do dueling banjos? There it was, the question that always followed. I nodded and tried not to let my lips go tight. I just knew she would ask me that, mainly because everyone always did. It's like a reflex. I'm no genius on the five-string or anything, 
but I already got the impression that asking for dueling banjos was about as welcome as asking a rock band for Freebird. But could you beat it? A second later, Rain said about the coolest thing she could have said. Don't worry, she said and patted me on the shoulder. I wouldn't ask you to play that. I'd be like that asshole who shouts Freebird and thinks she's the first one who did that on the whole planet. Nah, I like frailing better than finger picking anyway. I looked at her like I couldn't believe my ears, which was pretty much the truth. You're shitting me, I blurted and then wished I hadn't put it quite like that. Rain didn't seem to care, though, so I went on. You mean you even know there's more than one way to play banjo? Oh, yeah, she said and shrugged. She put her palms down on the concrete and stretched her legs out a bit. Well, I didn't until I saw Steve Martin on YouTube. It looked like he was just strumming it, but he was playing melody and rhythm at the same time. It blew me away. I didn't say anything for a second. This was eerie. I knew which video Rain was talking about because that was the video that made me want to learn to play. I must have watched it something like a thousand times. Wow, I said brilliantly. Wow, what? She asked, one eyebrow up. I almost winced. I've always wanted to be able to raise one eyebrow, but I could never figure it out. I can't stand seeing other people make it look so easy. But in the end, I forgave her because she ended up looking kind of adorable. Forget it, I said, and decided to move on before I started babbling. I was still having trouble dealing with her knowing about frailing. I couldn't think of anything bright to say, so I just turned and pointed at the empty lot. Well, you want to know what I see there? A tattoo shop. Really? You're an artist, too? When I was four, I said. But then I quit improving. Like a lot of inkers I've seen, she said, all serious, without pausing. I started to laugh at that, but only ended up snorting. She went on. You have any? I nodded and turned my back on her. I lifted up the hair from the back of my neck and let her have a look at the round Celtic knot design I had done there on my 18th birthday. I actually only ended up getting that tattoo because Jill really wanted to get one, but was too chicken to go through with it. Finally, I said I would get one first, but only if she sucked it up and got hers after. Nice, Rain said and gently touched the skin on my neck. I could tell from how she did it that she was tracing the lines of my tattoo with her finger. Very Celtic. Where'd you get that done? Ace is high, I replied. I let my hair drop down and turned around, just in time to see Rain jerk her hand back. She made like she wasn't sure what to do with her hand for a second, and finally just let it drop back on her lap. Oh, yeah, she said. I know that place. Down by the turnpike? Yep, I said, grinning. Now, I showed you mine. You show me yours. I leaned in. You do have ink, don't you? She raised one eyebrow again and chuckled. She knew I could damn well see the huge, colorful sleeves all over her forearms, the bright patterns on the side of her neck, her fingers, and on one calf, for that matter. They were kind of hard to miss, being super vibrant against her pale skin. From the way she was sitting with her legs crossed, I could also see one working its way up her thigh. I got a couple, she said, smirking. Start with that one, I said, pointing to her right arm maybe a little too quickly. She glanced down giggled and rolled her eyes. Oh yeah, figures. That's always the one everyone wants to see. Especially guys. Can you blame them? I said. Not really, I guess, she replied, smiling. She rolled her short sleeve up to her shoulder and gave me a good view, and I leaned in to make the most of it. The tattoo showed a naturally well-endowed, nude woman, standing about thigh-deep in ocean water, facing a sunset, with her back to the viewer. She had her head thrown back, and her hair ran almost all the way down to her waist. The lighting emphasized every last curve she had, and there were drops of water glistening all over her. It was damn near photographic quality. Nice, I said softly, and all of a sudden I found myself running my thumb over the ink. Apparently without realizing it, I had taken hold of Rain's arm when I leaned in to get a closer look. She didn't seem to mind, though. Whoever did this is a genius. Yeah, Rain said. Unfortunately, he went to L.A. Damn, too bad, I said. And I meant it. What made you decide to get this? It was a dream I had, Rain replied. This is you? I asked, looking up at her. Oh, no, she replied, shaking her head. 
I let go of her arm, and unfortunately, that meant I didn't have that great a view of the artwork anymore. It's not me, it's something I saw. I can't remember much specific about it, really, except I was walking along, and I saw her. She seemed so at peace with, like, everything. Somehow I knew that, and I could feel what she felt, too. I remember feeling it after I woke up, and for a while everything just seemed, I don't know, right. Like I didn't have to worry about anything because everything was going to be fine. Not easy, really, but fine. She looked down at the tattoo and tilted her head in a little shrug. I don't know. I guess I wanted to remember that feeling. Does that make any sense at all? Wow, I said after a second. I hate you. All mine means is that I like thick black symmetrical lines. She looked up at the sky, giggled, and shifted a bit. Oh, now you're just making fun of me. Am not, I said. Just then another hard breeze made me scrunch up, and I did something again without realizing it. Yoink, I said and then leaned up against her. My heat. Um, be my guest, she said, and I could tell by her voice that she was probably as surprised as I was. She was very warm, though. By the way she relaxed almost immediately, I could tell she must have been thinking the same about me. Hmm, she said, kind of lazily. You know, before she could go on, we got hit with another breeze, this one a bit stronger than the last. She dipped her head and leaned her cheek against my collarbone. What, Florida? she said. I snorted, again. After a second or two, she lifted her head a bit and leaned her cheek on my shoulder. So, Miss Tattoo Shop, she said, craning a bit to look at me. Aren't you going to ask about these? Before I could ask her what she meant, she put her hand on my wrist so that I could see the skin art on her fingers. I looked down at them. I, I guess I should, right? I said. I almost swallowed the first part of that sentence, but I managed to finish it. If you wanted to, she said. There's plenty others if you'd rather. That's cool, I said. She giggled again, and she didn't snort either. Am I the only one on the planet that does? She straightened up then and looked at me. You know what, she said. All this got me thinking, and it kind of gives me an idea. It does, I asked. Of course, she said and leaned in a bit like she didn't want her voice to carry. When she spoke again, she was almost whispering. It's the dumbest idea ever. I didn't say anything. I just looked at her and she looked right back at me. She blinked once, and then she leaned in again, slowly. She closed her eyes and tilted her head. I felt her breath on my lips, so gentle it almost wasn't there at all. I gasped and my eyes closed on my own, and then she kissed me. It was so soft and gentle and delicate and perfect. For a second, I completely forgot where I was and maybe even who I was. My mind was blown clear to pieces. I mean, this was exactly what I was hoping for ever since I laid eyes on Rain. But now that it was happening, I was almost too dumbfounded to respond. Finally, I got something close to a thought back into my head. But it sure as hell wasn't easy. I think it went something like, Wow, I'm really kissing her. She had my upper lip between both of hers now, and she gently ran the very tip of her tongue across it. I gasped again. She's kissing me, I thought. She's really kissing me. I couldn't form any other thought, not if I tried. I didn't want to try. I have no idea how long we stayed like that, but we came apart a little. I still had my eyes closed, and the only sound I could hear was my own breath. It was coming a bit harder and faster than it was just a second ago, and my heart was racing. That, I whispered, was the dumbest idea ever? Rain didn't say anything. Not that I cared. I needed more of her, and I needed it now. I leaned back in and pressed my lips against hers. Somehow I managed to keep myself from gasping, but it wasn't easy. She felt and smelled so beautiful. I was so lost in it that it took me a while before I realized that Rain didn't seem to be kissing me back this time. At first I glossed over it, and who could blame me, but 
Eventually, it began to feel a little off. You okay? I whispered. No answer. Rain, is everything okay? No answer. I leaned back and asked her again. She didn't respond. She wasn't even looking at me. Her eyes were lowered, like she was looking at my breasts. Rain? I said. She didn't say anything. I blinked once, twice, and then one more time. I lowered my head a bit and made eye contact with her. Her eyes looked distant and glazed, like she was thinking hard about something. Rain, are you okay? She still didn't say anything. In fact, she didn't even move a muscle on her face or anywhere else. Are you messing with me? Dead silence. I snapped my fingers in front of her nose. Nothing. I leaned in a little closer. Pow! I yelled. Finally, she blinked. She does respond to stimuli, I grinned. And did she ever respond? Rain spun faster than she had any business being able to, seeing as though at one point I was pretty sure she told me she was some kind of store manager who hated going outside and exercising. Whatever that may have been, before I knew what was happening, the woman hooked me full across the face and I spun like a top. I probably spat out some lame sound like wuh or nah or gluh or something. It's not my fault. We all look pretty silly when we get sucker punched. I went down like a wet towel, but she caught me by my hood and my waist, swung me back and heaved me full on into an empty storefront like a bouncer chucking out some asshole drunk. I saw all kinds of red, white, and blue sparks dance all over the place like the 4th of July, and I hit the dirt. Hard. My mouth filled with the taste of blood, and the entire side of my face felt like someone set fire to it and put it out by slamming it with a shovel. All told, all this was about the last thing I expected Rain to do. I was a bit hazy at that point, but I remember I heard a bunch of raised voices. I couldn't tell what anyone was saying, but I could tell by how the voices sounded that they were real mad. Kind of like how a dog knows you're mad at him just by the tone of your voice instead of by what you say. Like this one time I said Twinkie Sucker from the back of my throat and my mom's pug started looking all sad and scared. I heard scuffling, screaming, breaking windows, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Whatever was going on couldn't have been pretty. But I didn't have much time to think about it. Someone kicked me full on in my stomach and I rolled. And then someone yanked me up into the air and slammed me against a wall knocking me silly all over again. I shook myself and managed to blink back into focus, mostly. I squinted against a severe glare that I realized came from a nearby street lamp. In the small circle of light, I saw someone's body sprawled on the concrete like a broken doll, and I hissed in sympathy for the poor bastard. But then I realized I still had some problems of my own. I looked down to see Rain's face half a foot below. She was holding me up like she could bench a Buick, and I was far enough off the ground for my feet to dangle. She kind of looked like she was trying to explode my brain by looking at it. You're right, I wheezed. This is the dumbest idea ever. Although Rain was suddenly a lot livelier, she wasn't any more talkative. She tilted her head and her eyes began to soften, like she was looking at something over my shoulder. As far as I could tell, the only thing over my shoulder was the wall but I didn't bother to point that out. If she couldn't see what was right in front of her, there wasn't much I could do for the girl. I'm sorry I picked, I said, and spat out some blood on the pee without realizing it. The glob landed smack between her eyes like I just hawked a massive Kool-Aid-covered loogie. I meant to say I'm sorry I picked a crappy movie, but came up short when I realized what happened. Oops, I said, and spat out another glob on the pee, which landed on the first glob like some huge, gross, fat person belly flopping on you in the pool. There was no winning, so I just shut up. In that, at least, I appeared to have good company. Rain didn't move or react in any way. As weird as that was, what she did next made me wish she'd just go on staring and staying still. A little dot appeared on Rain's nose. No, it wasn't a dot. It was a little dimple in her flesh that pressed down deeper and deeper until it became a hole. As I watched, the hole got taller and thinner until it became a line, then a gash in her face that ran vertically up and down her nose. The line stretched until it ran from the top of her forehead, where it disappeared from sight in her scalp, clear down to her chin. 
You okay? I asked, slowly. Needless to say, Rain kept mum. Was I that bad? Several more lines sprouted outward from the center of the first line, forming a sort of asterisk over her entire face. I heard a faint squishing sound, like when you squeeze a latex glove full of jello. What? I said. I have bad breath or something? She tilted her head again, and then her whole face split apart and opened like a gigantic flower. Her eyes, the halves of her nose and mouth, they were all still there. Hell, I even saw her eyes blink. But it was like someone just hollowed out her skull and peeled it open. All along the inside of each undulating fleshy petal were rows and rows of spines as long as the first two knuckles of my smaller pinky. Yes, my pinkies are not the same length, but that's really not important right now. A gross glob of goopy goo shot out of the center of where her face used to be and hit me in my own like an open-handed slap. It smelled like wet, muddy, sweaty socks, soaked in sour milk and covered with rotten hamburger meat, and burned like a jellyfish sting. I'm not gonna lie. I gave Rain my dinner back then and there. Keep the change. If that weren't enough, I began to go numb and limp. After a moment, I couldn't feel my feet, legs, hands. Hell, nothing. I tried to say something, but my tongue was as numb as the rest of me. I'm sure I sounded brilliant. Well, this wasn't any kind of fun, and more than anything I wanted to get out of this so I could tell all my friends, and especially Jill, what a waste of time dating is. I was in a sort of a fix, though. The rain thing here, whatever kind of thing she was, got the drop on me fair and square. I had to hand it to her for technique and style, and I sort of had it coming for letting my guard down. But whatever. Miss Rain thing had it backwards. She was the one who made a powerful enemy tonight, not me. Like I said, I've had worse. I calmed myself, cleared my head, and did my best to steady my breathing. I stopped fighting the numbness and let it lay over me. The trick was to detach and disassociate. Forget and ignore. Miss Rain Thing isn't here. That lamp isn't here. I am not here. Nothing is here. Not even nothing. There we go. I was taught well. I can do this in my sleep. And I often do. It works wonders when I need to ditch a case of insomnia. Now it felt like I was alone. Floating in the dark. The dark was so thick. I could feel it compressing every inch of me. To get out, I'd need... The light. The light they tried to steal from me. The light I kept anyway. The light I kept because I refused to let it go. There. There's a tiny flicker. So tiny, it can rest on the tip of my finger. That was super tricky, but I got it. Don't think about how you'll pay for this later. That only makes the light go away. Oh, crap. I told you not to think like that. Get it back. Good. That was close. Make it bigger. Bit by bit. Little by little. There. Now I can cup it in my palms. Bigger still. No need for finesse or elegance. Just make it as big as you can. As big as it can go. It's nice and big now. Bigger than my big, fat, thick head. Getting there. But not quite. It's got to be bigger still. Keep going. Keep going. It's bigger than my old math teacher's ass. Almost there. It's bigger than I am. Don't quit. Don't quit. There. It's so big. It's pressing against everything. This is where I needed to get. Like a balloon about to pop. Almost there. Like I said, no need to be clever. Just make it as big as you can and... Chapter 2 I went off like a flash bomb. There was a burst of pure white light, brighter than the sun at high noon, and a blast like ten cannons going off. Both of those shot out from me and all around me. 
The wall behind me crumbled, leaving behind a neatly shaped round crater, and Miss Rain flew almost 20 yards away, getting at least three feet on the first bounce. She ended up somewhere in the middle of the vacant lot where my tattoo shop was going to be, and I fell flat on my ass against the wall. If you're confused, give me a second. When I told you earlier I was messed up, I meant it. I didn't mean quirky like I had to touch my left elbow if my right elbow bumped into something. I mean I am seriously messed up. I won't keep you in suspense anymore. I'm a knight. More specifically, a paladin. I mean a real paladin, literally blessed with the holy and cleansing light of God and the power and authority to smite the wicked and profane. I even have an official affiliation. Acolyte Sentinel, 3rd Class, 6 Points Cathedral, House Whiteheart, 5th Abbey. I'm an honest-to-God, sacred magic-flinging, holy knight. Yes, I am. Don't look at me like that. I am. Okay. You got me. Technically, I'm only an ex-paladin. X as in psycho-ex, and X as in excommunicated. Truth be told, I'm not supposed to be able to do all this righteous indignation magic light stuff anymore, but it can be frustratingly hard to get through to me sometimes. For example, this whole ex-paladin thing never really took all the way. But not because my old paladin bosses didn't try. They sure as hell went through a whole rigmarole to make sure I was just plain me, to lock my power away. But I had other ideas. Short version? I can still do some seriously pious holy magic crap, channeling the divine light of love, life, and creation. Don't get the wrong idea, it's not like I'm a wizard or anything. Although I did have a chance to work with one or two of those in my brief tenure as an anointed warrior. When I say brief, I mean I never even made it past Acolyte Third Class, which is put near the lowest possible rank allowed on active duty, before I was fired. Still, even though what I managed to learn wasn't much next to what those real spellslingers like wizards could throw around, I could still do some pretty cool stuff. Not to toot my own horn or anything, but I can honestly say I got pretty good at it. Unlike most things I've attempted in my life. Still, that thing I just did with the huge light bomb, while it sure as hell did the trick, it was not really a great thing to have to do. It's basically a last-ditch survival move, which wouldn't have been something a fully-fledged knight would enjoy doing, let alone an exiled newbie like me. Let me see if I can explain why. Imagine you want a nice, refreshing drink of water. And there's this man standing there with a tanker full of it. You walk up to him and hold out your cup and say to the nice man, Please, sir, could I have a drink? And then the guy pops open the valve and lets the whole tanker empty out all over you. Yeah, your cup would probably get filled to the top like you wanted, but you're also drenched. And something like 99.999 repeating percent of the water in the tanker just rolls off into the sewer where you wouldn't want to drink it anyway. You end up with one little cup you can drink, and all of the other potential drinks are gone. Basically, super inefficient. That makes sense? I hope so, because that's the best I got. I got free of the rain thing, but I felt like a six-month-old dish sponge. Well, at least I could move again, and this meant I could bless. Blessing would be one whole hell of a lot easier on me than what I just did, which was the spiritual equivalent of a quickie standing up in the kitchen. It was inefficient, sloppy, messy, and you're spent before you know what just went on. Now that I could bless, I could take my time and enjoy the scenery, you might say. I held out the first two fingers of my right hand, placed them on the bridge of my nose, and muttered the litany that would substantiate my blessing. Let me explain what I just said. Now, don't jump down my throat if my explanation sucks. Hell, at work, when I step up to the whiteboard and bust out the squeaky dry erase, I think I end up making my point even harder to understand. But here goes anyway. First of all, as I just pointed out, magic is real. I mean, really real. There are wizards and witches and ghouls and ghosts and vampires and demons and heaven and hell and just about anything else you can think of. You need to just go with this because whether or not you buy it doesn't change the fact that it's true. That said, I'm sure you're familiar with the concept of spells. I think we pretty much all are. 
A wizard or a witch wants something to happen, and they make it happen, usually by sheer force of will and give it juice by using anger or any other emotion that's handy. That, along with their sensitivity to whatever or wherever their magic comes from, makes the spell happen, and they usually seal the deal by declaring their intent, like with a magic word or incantation. Now, wizards have different spells for different occasions. A wizard wouldn't, for example, try to make a tree grow by shooting a fireball at it, usually. A paladin's magic is just the same, only different. If you're a paladin, willpower or emotion doesn't count for anything. It's all about belief and faith. And you don't need to have belief or faith in anything in particular. You only have to believe that you can do what you're trying to do and that what you're about to make happen is real. I know what you're thinking right now. You're probably thinking, wow, that's easy. I could do that. Sure, on paper, it sounds like a snap. But if it were that easy, there'd be a lot more of us out there. Like wizards, we have different flavors of magic. People have a lot of opinions on this, but basically it boils down to three major kinds. Blessings, prayers, and exactions. From 50,000 feet, here's the difference. Blessings are for healing. Prayers are for empowering. Exactions are for killing. In a nutshell, if you were trying to close up a cut, clear poison, or ditch a headache, you'd bless yourself or the person. If you wanted to beef up your fists or weapons or jump higher or run faster, you'd pray. On the other hand, if you wanted to generally just try to end something's life by shooting the light at it, you'd exact. One knight I trained with would say something like, B for benign, P for power, and E for exterminate. I guess that sort of works. Moving on. Just like wizards, we also have to speak our intent out loud in order to make anything happen. Why? Don't ask me. I only work here. Basically, when you speak out loud, you're opening the door and telling your prayer or blessing or exaction to get out of the house. And they can only do what they need to do once they get out of the house. That's called substantiating. It doesn't really matter what you say to substantiate. The same knight I just mentioned would use words like Yeehaw, or Thatherton, for some reason. He was pretty damn good at what he did, though, so I never said anything about it. Another guy used a weird mix of Hebrew and Arabic. How's that for bizarre? As for me, I always went with German, mainly because, let's be honest, it's hard to find a language that packs more punch. I never had any trouble believing that German would make my stuff work, because it just sounds so aggressive. The litany I chose for this blessing was just a passage I ripped out of Psalms 916. But the needy will not always be forgotten, and the hope of the afflicted will never perish. I used Google Translate to get the German, so don't blame me if it's terrible. Aber die bedürftigen nicht immer vergessen werden und die Hoffnung der Elenden wird nicht untergehen. A few seconds passed, and then the blessing took effect. All the nasty hurts the rain thing threw at me just washed off in a way like grime in a hot shower. I was good as new. Let me tell you something. If you've never experienced this, and you most likely haven't, then I can't really expect you to appreciate how incredible it feels. I might say it was like a shot of heroin on steroids, but first of all, that doesn't even make sense. And second, I have no idea what shooting heroin feels like. I stood up letting the light fill me, course through me, and complete me. That's the stuff. Nice and easy. Oh yeah. By the time I completed my blessing, I felt ten feet tall and bulletproof. Hell, for all I knew, I was. Whatever, I was ready for twenty rain things now, so where was she? Crap. Rain was already in midair halfway toward me. Christ, did she really just jump from all the way the hell over there? Looked like it. She landed about ten feet short, and then lunged at me like I just kicked her mom in the face. I lifted the first two fingers of my right hand sideways to my lips and grabbed my right wrist with my other hand. At that moment, it almost felt like that one time when I was ten and my sister dared me to go in the batting cage and try to hit the fastest pitch the machine could toss. Just like then, I had maybe half a second to decide how to swing. I didn't have a chance then. Hopefully this would be different. Unterbrechen. I muttered, bracing myself. I shot out my hand and then I let loose the very first exaction I ever learned. The rebuke. It was a shot in the dark, really. But I really didn't have much time for anything better. 
The rebuke is a quick and dirty, low-level exaction that's real useful against mindless evil stuff that's just about as low-level. Basically, if the bad thing you're trying to rebuke is the rough equivalent of a drooling, helmet-butting mouth breather, then it'll be stopped in its tracks, run away, or maybe even get knocked on its ass. As it turned out, the rain thing got knocked on her ass, which surprised the holy hell out of me. She just bounced back and hit the dirt like she was thrown from a moving train. Huh? I said. I'm sure my jaw was hanging open or something. That really shouldn't have worked like that. Not even close. Let me explain. Based on everything I saw, I was positive that Rain was possessed. Not positive positive, more like the fake positive. But really, one second Rain was there, and the next she's some crazy flesh beast. I didn't really know what else to call it. I've dealt with demonic possessions before, and they were pretty damn close to this. Typically, you'd want to exercise them, but... A rebuke can buy you a little time, if only a little. Only my rebuke did a lot more than a little. Rebukes shouldn't work that well against possessed people. It's true there isn't all that much left of a person once they're possessed, but there's almost always enough to ignore most of what a rebuke could dish out, because rebukes are useless against human beings. At most, I was hoping to throw Rain off balance, maybe, so I could sidestep or something, but... That shouldn't have worked, I said. And then, as if I expected the rain thing to know the answer, I went on. Why did that work? The rain thing moved a little and rolled over. She sputtered, spat, and then got on all fours. She looked like a whipped puppy. Aw, I said. I guess for some reason I started feeling rotten. Okay, I know she did try to eat my face, but she was a pretty nice girl all in all, when she was normal anyway. On top of that, I was only just now coming down off my rush of combat adrenaline, and I was having a really hard time squaring in my head that the girl I was crushing on only a second ago was now some kind of raging flesh beast. Such is the life of a holy knight, I guess. Um, I said, sorry? I think I actually leaned sideways to get a look at her face and wringed my hands. The rain thing looked around like she forgot where she was for a second, and then she saw me. It was so weird. Her face had almost closed back together, but not quite, and it looked like it was opening and closing just a tiny bit in time with her breathing. Her eyes blinked again, which, let me tell you, just looked plain wrong. It looked like she was waiting for me to do something, so... I did. Um, I began again. I'm the world's best orator, as you can see. You still want that drink, Miss Rain? My eyes were wide open, and my mouth stretched down on one side. I looked sideways at her, hoping she would take this as her cue. She didn't. She just fidgeted a little and went right on looking me over. I'll buy, I said. Oh, not that I'm, you know, not that I'm implying you can't. I mean, I know you can pay, so don't think I'm... Look, if you want to pay, just go ahead. I won't say a thing. I was just thinking since I would just, just... I need rain. That okay? Forget the paying and the drink thing. Just, is Miss Rain down in there somewhere? I swear to God, that's really what I sound like when I have no idea what I'm saying. Sometimes a sentence is halfway out of my mouth and then I jump the track and dig a new dirt road in the ditch. For fun one time, I left my phone's sound recorder app running for five minutes during a meeting at work where I was pitching a new project. It was horrific. I have no idea why I still have a job. Now... I'm no genius when it comes to reading faces when they're all together in one piece, let alone when they're split up in six pieces, but unless I was on something, it looked like the rain thing was kind of scared. Or maybe she was trying to figure out what the hell just happened, and more importantly, whether or not it would happen again. You know, kind of like when a kid walks right into a sliding glass door and you see him look around all confused for a second. The bottom line was, I don't think rain got anything I was saying. Vvt, vvt. My pocket shook. Of course I'd get a text right now. I knew it had to be Jill, too, which means if I didn't reply immediately, she'd go on texting me like a goon until I did. And you know, I was thinking just a second ago that I probably shouldn't make any moves, because the rain thing looked like one of those bobcats or something that would see a hiker in the woods, stare for a second, and then book it once the hiker so much as breathes. In fact, 
The rain thing already edged back a bit a few times while I was talking, so I was probably right. But the thing is, when I feel my phone go off, it's practically a conditioned reflex to reach into my pocket, unlock it, swipe a quick LOL or ROFL to acknowledge receipt of said text to stave off any follow-ups, and put the phone back. I've broken it down to such a smooth motion, you'd go nuts if you saw it. I was like a goddamn gunslinger. I guess the rain thing must have thought I was a goddamn gunslinger because as soon as she saw me go for my phone, she hunched back, her whole face split wide open, and she screamed like she was on fire. I jumped and dropped the phone, which only made it worse. That was when the cops saw us.